Grab your Bible this morning. Open it or turn it on to Jonah chapter 3. We're in this series. We've been asking an important question about our faith all year in 2023. What's our question? That's right. What do I believe? In the past three weeks, we've been asking it a little bit more in depth. What do I believe about obedience? And we're using the story of Jonah to talk about obedience and what obedience means and discover some great truths about obedience. And Jonah's going to teach us some really great stuff this morning, actually Jonah and the people of Nineveh, because they jointly teach us about uh, obedience this morning. Uh, Jonah is one of those people, I think, in scripture that maybe you've had a person in your life that you learned mostly what not to do by being around them. Like that's kind of Jonah, right? Most of the time we learn about what not to do in our relationship with God from Jonah. But there are some times where we can learn, hey, what, what should we do? And um, what can we see about our relationship with God in regards to Jonah? Well, chapter three happens to be one of those moments for Jonah. So I would say this is maybe his mountaintop time and chapters one and two are his valley. Unfortunately, chapter four, he goes back to the valley. Um, but chapter three, he's on the mountaintop. So we're, we're excited about that. Chapter three, interestingly, we'll notice, can be divided really into two sections. Verses one through three, three talk about Jonah's obedience to God. And verses four through 10 talk about the people of Nineveh's obedience to God. And we can learn some really neat things from both of them as we read this morning. So I'm going to jump in and read Jonah chapter three together, and then um, we'll make some points in regards to the section and to God's word. Verse one, then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. This time, Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh believed God's message. And from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. Then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city. No one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps even yet God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. Jonah, chapter three. We can see a couple things. Uh, let me start with verses one through three. A couple things that Jonah teaches us about obedience. The first one is in verse one and two, when Jonah changes his mind and begins to head towards Nineveh again. It says, then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I've given you. The first thing I noticed in these verses is that God gives second chances. Aren't you happy about that? <laughs> that God gives second chances. Uh, I noticed that God kept revealing himself to Jonah when he was choosing to disobey. And I'm so thankful that God is faithful when I am unfaithful. Amen? Amen. See, God was giving Jonah second chances over and over again. And all of us have seasons like that. All of us have seasons where we choose for one reason or another to make our life the number one priority instead of God. And we concentrate on ourselves instead of the Lord. And sometimes life just continues, but sometimes life starts getting hard and difficult. And we wonder why things are going crazy and haywire. Now it's good to know that when we are not making God a priority, he's still there. He's still making us a priority. One of my favorite movie lines was in a movie we just watched the other day with all the young adults at our house on Halloween night. We watched um, The Count of Monte Cristo. 
And in the Count of Monte Cristo, he's in jail, he's in prison, he's hanging out with a priest, and uh, the priest has found this elaborate uh, storehouse of treasure, and um, he finally reveals it to um, the man who's in prison, and he says, hey, don't, don't use this treasure that you find for revenge. And he said, I most certainly will. And he says, God doesn't want you to. And the man says, I don't believe in God. And the priest says, well, God believes in you. And that's true in this story, and it's true in our lives too. That God believes in us. Even if we're choosing to, to walk away from him, to run from him, he's still there. He's still communicating. He's still waiting for us to get back on track. I love what we see here is that God doesn't give up on Jonah and God won't give up on you either. God continued even to use Jonah. What we see in verse one and two is this moment where God is saying, Jonah, I'm gonna use you again. So I'm gonna talk to you a second time and I'm gonna give you an opportunity to obey. So God's saying, Jonah, I've restored you and I'm willing to use you again. So God continues to say, I'm gonna use Jonah even though he had disobeyed and ran from God. See, disobedience doesn't disqualify us from being used by God. Now, you might have to sit on the bench for a while when you disobey and get your healing and work on your relationship with Jesus and make sure that he's number one before he puts you back into the game. But our disobedience never stops us from being used for the Lord. We're in relationship with God, and he's not naive to the fact that we are sinful creatures and that we go our way. That doesn't shock him. He's not like totally surprised when Pastor Mark doesn't follow the Lord one day or one moment. He's not like, oh my gosh, I totally thought Mark was perfect. What happened? (laughs) That's not what he's thinking. It's not what he's thinking about you either. He knows that we go astray. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus' love, acceptance, and forgiveness from the cross covers our life every single day. That's why his forgiveness and his blood covers our past, present, and future sin so that you and I can live freely in the kingdom of God. See, God is patient with us. He also disciplines us. He's also quick to forgive. And he's ready to put us back into commission when the Holy Spirit has fully healed us. Another lesson that we can learn about disobedience or obedience from Jonah is that God follows through on his plans. Now, there's something very interesting happening in the story of Jonah. Remember chapter one, Jonah's running from God. Chapter two is Jonah's prayer from the belly of a fish. Now, chapter three, right at the beginning of the chapter, what's happening? God's saying, Jonah, I still have a plan and I need you to be a part of it. And what was God's plan? The plan was to warn the people of Nineveh about their evil and God needed Jonah to help with his plan. The plan is still in place. God's not going to stop his plan because Jonah is being disobedient. God doesn't stop his plan to share Jesus with the world because we choose not to. God's going to follow through with his plan. See, the people of Nineveh still have a serious problem. They still have a problem that God needs to address, and their evil was so bad that God needed to address it. And God wanted to use Jonah to do that. But the interesting thing is one of the themes we see throughout the book of Jonah is Jonah's problem. And Jonah's problem is he is consistently selfish. Don't raise your hand, but just in your own mind. Is there anybody else in the room like Jonah, consistently selfish? Like, how do we do that? Like, we do it, don't we? Now, I'll tell you why I think we do it. Because we live in America. And everything in our culture is about us. It's about me. And so that's just the culture that we live in. Eventually, our culture is going to seep into us, isn't it? And so one of our challenges as Americans is that we have to watch out that the narcissism doesn't end up in our heart and in our mind and in our life. Else, we become very selfish. That's just what happens by being an American. If we lived in another country, in another culture, then we'd have to watch out for something else in that culture that would seep into our heart and our mind that would pull us away from Jesus. This just happens to be our challenge, that our culture happens to be consistently selfish, just like Jonah was, and we have to watch out for it. So the the story of Jonah is a great message for us as Americans to say, hey, let's make sure that Jesus is first and not ourselves. See, there's something really interesting happening here. God is trying to do something 
with the Ninevites, but all Jonah can see is how it's affecting him. See, God's plans are so much bigger than ours. God had a plan that was going to encompass a large city and everyone in that city. God had a plan to reveal himself to Nineveh again, but all Jonah could see was how God's plan was going to cause him discomfort. What does that mean for us? Well, we often do the same, don't we? God wants to use us to minister to someone and all we can see is how it will cause us discomfort. God asks us to give financially and all we can see is how that'll bring us discomfort. God wants us to talk to a homeless people and a person and all we can see is how that will bring us discomfort. God wants us to talk to our neighbor and all we can see in that is, oh, that's really uncomfortable. I'm not sure I can do that. All we can see is our discomfort. God has a plan to reveal himself to every single person on the West Plains. Will you join him? Will you join the Holy Spirit throughout your day to glorify Jesus in our part of the world and not listen to your discomfort? See, you have an opportunity during your lifetime to discover that God wants to use you. He wants to use your gifts, your talents, your passions. He wants to give you a calling to touch a world with the message of Jesus Christ. But if we wake up each morning more concerned about our plans than God's plans, we will miss out on the great adventure of fulfilling his plan for our life. And that's what Jonah missed out on. He missed out on it for a while. Eventually he caught on, but if we don't, we will miss God's biggest plans and we'll be focused on ourselves our entire life. The third lesson that Jonah can teach us about obedience is obedience reveals our heart. Obedience reveals what's going on in my heart. How how I decide to be in relationship with God tells you a lot about what's going on in my heart. Now, verse three says something interesting. It says, this time, Jonah obeyed the Lord's commands. Now, there's an interesting phrase right here. It's the first two words in the verse. This time. Now, interestingly, right? We know what he did the first time. He ran. He ran away from God. He disobeyed God. But this time, Jonah obeyed the Lord. Now, why did Jonah obey this time? Because his heart was changed. He had a change of heart. Now, unfortunately, it took a near-death experience to change his heart, (laughs) right? It took the belly of a fish. It took stomach acid for three days to change his heart. But he got there. Now, don't raise your hand on this one either, but has that ever happened to you? Has it ever taken you a while to get a change of heart about something? About how to love your neighbor, love a friend? Like someone you don't like? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? See, Jonah was looking at his own relationship instead of the Lord. But he saw God as his savior and was in awe of the goodness of God. And as a result of being in the fish, he wanted to obey this time. He had a change of heart. Jesus said it like this in John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands. If you love me, you'll obey. See, love and obedience are connected. We we see this throughout scripture. Love and obedience are connected. Jesus wants us to obey him because we love him. He wants our motivation to obey him to be because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The reason we obey is because we recognize Jesus' death and resurrection as the love of God for us. See, the cross communicates his love, his forgiveness, and his acceptance for every single one of us individually, but also for the whole world. And so our obedience reveals who we love. Now, we choose to obey 
because we believe God loves us so much. Not because we live in fear of retribution or punishment. That's not the right way to obey God. Even though we know that God will eventually hold us all accountable, that's not the correct way to obey him. It's because we love him and we want to honor him. So we obey because we want to, not because we have to, right? Have you ever had a job where you went and the boss was so mean to you that you just felt like you had to do everything because if you didn't, you would get fired. And if you didn't, there'd be retribution. And if you didn't, there would be punishment. Is it, wasn't that like the worst place in the world to work? That was the worst. It was a really difficult relationship, a very challenging place to be. We want to be in a place where we recognize the goodness of God and we say, I want to obey God because I recognize his goodness and his love and his grace in my life. And I just can't stop obeying him because he's so good to me. He's so awesome to me. And he blesses me all the time. I just, I just want to be in relationship with him. And I never want to break that. I don't want to do anything to break my relationship with God because he's so good. We obey because we want to. Now, Jonah, he needed time in the belly of a fish to figure that out, didn't he? But he did. See, Jonah teaches us that God gives us second chances to obey. That God follows through on his plans and that obedience reveals our heart. The next group of people that talk to us about obedience are the people of Nineveh. So look at them with me. The people of the city of Nineveh also teach us several great lessons about obedience. The first one is this, that we learn that God sees everything. There's something interesting in this story, that God sees everything. There was a, a mindset, I would think, in, in the Jewish culture, and this is maybe something that kind of got Jonah in trouble in his theology and his thinking, and that was that God was really only watching the chosen people of God, the Israelites. Everyone else, he doesn't really care about. But the story of Jonah reveals something different, different doesn't it? It reminds us that God sees everything. God sees everyone. God sees everything on the planet that's going on. And there are times where things that are going on outside of Israel that God is unhappy with. So God sends Jonah to Nineveh because he sees everything. And he saw the condition of the Ninevites' hearts. He saw the way that they were treating one another. He saw the intense evil that was happening every minute of every day in Nineveh. They, there's a quote in the section that actually says, they must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. So what, what we see happening, there was just evil all the time and violence all the time. And God saw that. And God said, Man, this is really not what I want for this city. I want them to understand my love and my grace for them and for one another. So God saw them. He saw the condition of their hearts, and he sees that in us too. He sees our disobedience. He sees everyone's disobedience. And this is an important truth for us to believe about obedience, that God sees everything. Hebrews 4.13 says it like this, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. God sees everything, and God will hold us accountable for everything. Now, please don't get the impression that because God sees everything, he is angry with you or wants to destroy you. That's not always the case. Seeing everything is just part of being God. He's so big. He's so awesome. He's so immense. It's just simply part of being the most powerful thing in the universe. You see everything. Because you created everything, he sees everything. It's just part of being who God is. It doesn't mean he's going to address every evil thing done by man or every evil thing you and I do because that would violate the free will that he gave each and every one of us to live in. So God holds this interesting balance in check all the time. His justice and his judgment and his ability to deal with evil, but our free will and this free will that you and I have was given to us at creation. It's, it's the very thing that allows you and I to choose to be in relationship with God. Without it, God never really knows whether we are choosing to be in relationship, choosing to love him, 
choosing to want him and wanting to obey him or not. If you take free will away, you have robots. You have slaves. And that's not what God wanted. It's not what he intended. He wants relationship. So there has to be this perfect balance of God's free will, but also we know that there's this balance of his justice. Now, what Hebrews tells us is that at some point, God is going to pour out his justice on all of us, every one of us. We see that in the book of Revelation, that that's part of the end of the story, is that God will bring everything back to a state of perfection and righteousness. What we see is that God will not violate our free will, but he's also sovereign to step in at any moment, at any time, to do anything he wants. He's also just which means that every one of us will be held accountable to his perfect justice for the things we've done while here on earth. But being accountable is an interesting thing. It's very interesting in light of the cross because our accountability with God now takes on a whole different level because of Jesus' sacrifice. The accountability is different because if you believe in Jesus as your savior and you live for him while you're here on earth, even though you're still having moments of failure and disobedience, you will not be held accountable for the sins you do while you're here, Paul said, because of the forgiveness and the grace of Christ that flows into your life every single day. So when you and I get to heaven and, and we stand before God, while we, will, we may see the things that we have done that disobeyed the Lord in our lifetime, we will also be completely forgiven of those things and not held accountable for them because of Christ's blood in our life. Amen. But if you choose not to believe in Jesus, if you choose not to believe in him, if you choose not to follow him all the days of your life, then you will be held accountable for everything you do and say, in this lifetime. The other interesting thing is God will judge justly. He will judge justly according to the standard that he's established in his word. Now here's what's incredible. The standard is not the good or bad that you have done and that it evens out in the end. That's not the standard. The standard is perfection. That's the standard of God Almighty. That's why you and I need Jesus forgiveness. This is why we need Jesus perfection to cover our imperfection so that God the Father sees Jesus in us, not our own sin. This is why Jesus died on the cross to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, why the cross sets us free from our sins done while we are here. See, obedience becomes a new habit for every believer in Jesus because God sees everything and we desire to obey our heavenly father. The second lesson we learned from the Ninevites is that the people of Nineveh obeyed God the first time. Now this is a massive switch, right? Let's look at this because this is a really big part of the story of Jonah. Look at verse five. It says the people of Nineveh believed God's message. In verse six, it talks about the king of Nineveh. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. In verse 10, it says, God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways. Now, here's what's interesting. The people of Nineveh, they obeyed God the first time. In Jonah's case, he needed a large adult spanking to get back on track and start obeying again because he did not obey the first time. He didn't even obey the second time. He had to get thrown in the ocean. But here's what's interesting. The Ninevites obey the first time. They immediately stop their evil ways. They start fasting. They put on burlap. They're throwing ashes on themselves. And you know, you gotta get this in your, in your mind for a second. You gotta also cut out a little piece of burlap for your dog and one for your kitty and one for your gerbil, and somehow you got to get one in the fishbowl. Like, this is crazy. I mean, they are, they are going into an, an intense moment of mourning and sorrow and saying, I am very sorry for the way that I've lived. They're immediately stopping their evil ways. 
Now, while we are all thankful that God didn't give up on Jonah and that he doesn't give up on us either, obeying God the first time he asks is a much better scenario for us and everyone. It's always a better scenario. So look at the difference between Jonah and the Ninevites. Jonah didn't obey the first time. And what was the result? He ended up in two really, really life-altering circumstances that almost killed him. One was a storm that almost killed him and unfortunately almost took out all the sailors on the ship too. So his bad decision would have been consequences for other people as well, which is true for us. Sometimes our bad decisions affect other people, don't they? If you're a parent, you know that. Jonah didn't obey the first time. So the result was he ends up in a storm and then he ends up in the belly of a great fish. That's completely different from the Ninevites. The Ninevites obeyed the first time and the result was God pouring out his grace upon them. Now here's what's interesting. And I think is something that as the people of God, we need to hear. Sometimes we, we can just get comfortable in our relationship with God. And when we get comfortable in our relationship with God, like Jonah did, we think we get to dictate how the relationship goes. And we think we can just run away and do whatever we want. And because God loves us more than we even see ourselves, God says, I won't let you do that. I love you too much. So I'm going to send something difficult your way because I need you to see that your holiness is more important than your happiness. I need you to see that your relationship with me needs to be way more important than anything else. Now, here's what's interesting, and I've seen this a lot. Um, Solomon talks about this in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Have you noticed that often the people of God who know Jesus, know his forgiveness, know his grace, who decide to disobey him, end up in trouble and struggle through it? While some people that don't even know God, the drug dealer in town has the best house in town, the best car in town. <laughs> and you're like, how come that happens? Well, because when you and I understand the grace of God and we understand the goodness of our life in Christ, God's not gonna let that slide. <laughs> and so because of what we know, because of what we've experienced in Christ, we know that the, 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 the spiritual things of this life are way more important than the physical things. And as a result, God does things in our life that he doesn't sometimes do in an unbeliever's life because we know the truth and we need to get back on track. And so sometimes we end up in a situation just like Jonah. See, the lesson for us is this. When we disobey God, the chances of our life getting much more difficult become higher. Now, not because God is going to send something awful our way, but because living outside the will of God means we are forcing God's hand. Now, not, not his hand to do something to us, but to pull his hand away. And to say, if, if you want to try to go your own way for a while, I'm going to let you do that because that's the free will of God. But you and I both know what happens. When we go try to live life our own way, on our own, in our own decisions, without the help of the Holy Spirit, it just doesn't go so well. We end up in crazy circumstances. Instead of obeying God the first time, which is always better. See, first time obedience allows God's blessing to flow freely in and out of your life, just like it did for the Ninevites. As the Ninevites quickly obeyed God, did you notice that the grace and the forgiveness and the goodness of God flowed into their life immediately? Immediately. Because they put themselves in a good place with the Lord. It means that God's blessings can flow freely in and out of your life. Now, I'm not talking about physical blessings. I'm talking about spiritual blessings. The things that are much more important in our life because spiritual blessings are far superior to physical ones. First time obedience means God's presence and strength is always with us. It just, it never leaves. It's always a part of our life. First time obedience means we don't have to deal with the challenges of living outside of God's best. So first time obedience will always be something that you and I should shoot for as the followers of God. 
Now, the last lesson the Ninevites teach us about obedience is that obedience is for everyone. Obedience is for everyone. Now, this is good news because I think there are some people that think obedience is not for them in our culture. Have you noticed that? That there's some that think they are higher than everything, above the law, above God, above everything, and they can do whatever they want to whoever they want, whenever they want. And that's not true with God. Obedience is for everyone, from the greatest to the least. So in Nineveh, what we see is everyone fasted and put on burlap, even the king. It said, interestingly, right, there's an interesting moment here with the king that I want to communicate with you that's really important. It says what? The king what? Stepped down from his throne. And what does that, what does he mean? What, why did he do that? What is he saying? He's saying, I'm not the ultimate authority here. Who is? God is. I'm not the king. He's the king. I'm stepping down. Because I recognize I need to humble myself before God Almighty. That's a powerful moment. That's a very, very important moment for the king where he's saying everyone, everyone will be held accountable to God. Everyone needs to obey. And then they take it a step further. I mean, that's kind of crazy to think about putting burlap on your dog. Like this is, this is where they go. I mean, they're going all out here. When, they, when we've disobeyed God's commandments, there's a requirement of sorrow as we head towards obedience again. We call this repentance, and we see this in the Ninevites. Repentance means you turn and you go the opposite direction. So they were living in evil, they were being horribly violent to one another, and it said that they stopped doing those things and they started living the other way. And that's why God forgave them and gave them grace. This is what repentance is. It means we were disobeying and we choose to start obeying. Now, repentance has several purposes that are really great for our life. Let me share three with you. The first purpose of repentance is it shows God we are sorry for disobeying his plans for our life. It shows God what we're saying to the Lord when we repent we're saying to, Lord, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for disobeying your plans for my life. In other words, what we are saying is I acknowledge that God's plans and purposes are better for my life than my own. That the way that I was living, the way that I was choosing to live, the way that I was choosing to disobey, that that, that was not God's plan for my life. And I'm choosing to walk in God's plan for my life. Second, Another purpose of repentance is this. It helps us get our hearts and minds refocused on God's best for our lives. Because when we choose to disobey, whenever any of us choose to disobey the Lord, disobey his word, what we're really doing, what, what really happens is in our heart and in our mind, we convince ourselves that what we're thinking and what we're feeling is better than what God wants us to do. Now, I, I think this is, the, the biggest example we have of this right now is the sexualized culture we see in the world right now. Right now in the world, we are kind of going the opposite of God's plans sexually. And so what we're saying is, as, a, as a world, as a planet, is that our ideas of sexuality are better than God's ideas. And repentance would say, hey, I'm going to come in line with what God has planned for my life and what God says for my life sexually. And I'm going to choose to live that way and I'm going to choose to live in obedience to that. Repentance means we get our heart and our mind refocused on God's best for our life. And God's word tells us what his best is. Amen? I'm so thankful for God's word. That you and I can read every day and just read through it and say, oh, that's cool. That's God's best for me. I recognize that. And Holy Spirit, help me live in that place. Because I just want to be, I want to live exactly where God wants me to do. I want to be in God's best for my life. The third thing that repentance does is it shows those around us that the way we were living was wrong. 
And we're choosing to reestablish relationship with God and obey his commands for our life moving forward. Here's something really important. Repentance is a statement. It's a statement to those around you. Sometimes the the thought or the the thing that the enemy says to us is, you know, you you shouldn't change, You, you shouldn't repent because, I mean, you've gone so far already and it would, it's gonna be embarrassing to start telling people around you uh, that you were wrong and that um, you need, you're gonna start living for Jesus. That's just gonna be really difficult. So you, you just probably should just keep doing what you're doing. Now, there's a, there's a truth to that. Might it be a little bit embarrassing to talk about the fact that the way you were living was wrong and, and you're getting it right? Yes, but in that conversation, who gets the glory? Jesus does. If you word your conversation right, Jesus gets the glory. If your conversation sounds like, yeah, the way I was living, I just recognized I was reading my Bible and I was going to church and pastor was talking to me about it. And I recognized that the the way I was living was was not right. So I'm I'm choosing not to live that way anymore because because Jesus loves me and I love him. And I, I wanna be in relationship with him so much I'm just excited that he's given me a second chance and his grace is for my life and his forgiveness is for my life. And I just can't tell you how great I feel, how, for, how free I feel in his forgiveness now that I'm gonna not live this way and live la- that way. If you have that conversation with somebody that's not living for Jesus, what are they gonna think? Who is this Jesus guy? I mean, I gotta find out more about him. What do you mean he was loving and kind and gracious and forgiving to you when you did something wrong? I I never heard of God like that. So it gives you a great opportunity to reveal Jesus to others as you reestablish with God your relationship with God and obey his commands. What we're saying is I was wrong and God was right. What we're saying is my relationship with Jesus is so much more important than what I was caught up in. The people of Nineveh reveal this to us. It says the people of Nineveh believed God's message and from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. This is intense repentance. This is an entire city. Maybe... 150, 200,000 people. Could you imagine just driving into Spokane and everybody sitting in a heap of ashes in their front yard? That'd be a big deal. I mean, that'd be, that'd be pretty awesome. Nobody's working. Nobody's going to work. All of us are repenting for days on end. We don't walk our dog because our dog's got to sit in ashes too. Everything's happened. This, this would be an intense moment of repentance. How many of you think that we need that in the church and in our country. I think that would help. I think it'd help a lot. I think it'd say a lot. I think it's what we need. Because everyone, from the greatest to the least on our planet, will be held accountable to how they obey God. So what should we do? What should we do as the people of God? How, how can we help this to work out in our life and in the West Plains? Well, I think it's simple. Obey God's word and the voice of the Holy Spirit the first time. (laughs) The first time. Why? Because we love God. Simply because we love him. And we want others to see Jesus in us. And when we obey Jesus, they do. They see Jesus in us, especially in a culture that's moving more and more away from obeying Jesus. When we say, no, I'm I'm not going to do that. I'm going to obey Jesus. And you don't even have to say anything about Jesus anymore. It says a whole bunch of stuff about him. And so I want to encourage us to be people that because we love God, we just say, I'm going to obey God's word and I'm going to obey the Holy Spirit when he speaks to me the first time. Would you stand with me? I want us to just take a minute and respond to the word of the Lord this morning. And as we do, let me just um, remind you of a great verse in Psalm 119, 105. 
Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. God's word is, is what guides our life. It's in the darkness. Are we living in darkness? We are. In the darkness, God's word reveals the truth. God's word is the light that you and I need to walk through life and not stumble, not fall, not get off track, stay on the yellow brick road, however you want to say it, right? God's word does that. It's, it's the flashlight in our life in a dark world. And so we need God's word. The word is a lamp for our feet. It's a light for my path. And we call to obey it every single day. And I'm so thankful we have God's word. That's why it's so important for us to be in it every day. That's why it's important for us to take the November Bible reading plan home and start it. Amen? Well, let's respond. Would you close your eyes with me? I just want to ask a question because I, I don't want us to leave this morning without the opportunity to do, maybe for each of us to just um, make our heart right with Jesus. Maybe there's someone in the room and um, you just, you know there's something in your life that is just, um, it's not right with the Lord. Maybe it's something you did a while back and you haven't repented of it. Maybe it's something you're in right now and you need to change it. You need to start living different. And so you, you recognize and you know that you need to get back on track with the Lord and you need to repent and you need to obey. Now, the great thing is 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins to the Lord, he is faithful and just and he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so I'm gonna pause for about a minute and I'm just gonna let it be quiet in the room because your disobedience is not between you and me. I don't need to see your hand raised this morning. Your disobedience is between you and Jesus, between you and your Savior. And so whatever it is that, that is in your life that you know needs to get right with Jesus, I'm just going to give us a minute, and I'm going to ask you to talk to Jesus about that and just say, Jesus, I'm sorry for fill in the blank. Would you help me live in the Spirit, not in my flesh, and would you help me obey you? Jesus, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for a reminder of how important our obedience is to you. Thank you for reminding us that what you've done on the cross is so important to our obedience. You loved us so much that you left heaven and came to earth and died for us that we might be whole and healed, forgiven and saved. Lord, we love you for that. Jesus, we also recognize something really important, that our obedience is connected to somebody else believing in Jesus on the West Plains. That our neighbors and our friends and our coworkers and all the people that we come in contact with on the West Plains, our obedience to you will help them see Jesus in us. And so, Lord, we just want to pray right now that, Holy Spirit, would you fill us afresh? Would you help us to live in the Spirit, not in our selfishness? Help us to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us, Holy Spirit, to hear your voice all throughout the day and say yes to you really quickly. 
And sometimes that yes is saying no to the world and sometimes that yes is saying, to say, uh, we need to go serve someone, we need to go love someone, we need to smile at someone, we need to share Jesus with someone. Whatever it might be, Holy Spirit, would you help us to hear you and to quickly obey you, say yes to you? Because we wanna be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. And Lord, help us to be a holy people, to be a people that walk in purity and righteousness so that the world sees that the best way to live is to honor God and his word. We thank you, and Jesus, thank you, Lord, for that reminder this morning. Even though it's a tough one, Lord, thank you for what you do in our lives. And thank you for the story of Jonah and what it's revealing to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We all said? Amen. 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 Well, our prayer partners are going to come up. If you have anything that you want to pray about this morning, I just want to encourage you, come up and pray with them. They would love to pray with you. Hey, don't forget that um, you should grab an Operation Christmas Child shoe box if you're leaving and haven't done that yet. And always remember, Jesus loves you very much. So do Kate and I. Have a great week.